Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When we look at the scriptures, the Bible calls faith precious. So let me ask you a question. Is your faith in Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, is it indeed precious to you? Because many people are way too casual about their faith. They do not understand the relevance for their belief today, tomorrow, and until they leave this world and enter into the kingdom of God. What I'm speaking about is this. Many people will say, I'm a believer. I understand that I am a sinner. And therefore, I do indeed accept what Yeshua did for me on that cross, dying, shedding His blood as the means of my forgiveness so that I'm forgiven and God will accept me when I die into His kingdom. Now that's wonderful and that's true, but our faith is much more than that. Our faith should affect everything that we do, every thought, every word, our behavior. So do you understand this faith that should be precious to you? Well, what we're going to do today is to begin a new series on Paul's epistle to the Colossians. And through this epistle, we learn a great deal about our faith, what we should believe and how that belief should change our life. So if you want your life to be pleasing to God, if you want to see transformation change, living a life that is exciting, one that you're experiencing the things of God and accomplishing the will of God, that I invite you to join with me for the next several weeks as we go through this epistle to the Colossians. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to that epistle, the Colossians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul is writing here and we're going to see that this letter is very significant in growing, maturing, transforming an individual whereby we become faithful. And there's the key. If we have faith, we ought to be faithful people. So let's begin. Chapter 1, Colossians and verse 1. Paul says here, Paul, an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ. So Paul wants everyone to know that he's an apostle, that is, that he has a calling on his life. He didn't come up with this. This did not originate in his own mindset. God called him. And that word apostle means one that is sent forth with authority, and that authority comes from the assignment and the one who assigned that task to him. So Paul writes here, an apostle of Messiah Yeshua, and here's the key, through the will of God. He wants to affirm to these individuals that what he's doing is not of himself. It is not through his plans and purposes, but rather this all has to do with what? The answer is the will of God. In other words, what we see is that Paul was extremely committed to the will of God. And let me ask you, are you committed to the will of God? Do you understand what is the will of God generally? What is He going to accomplish in this world? And what is the will of God specifically for your life? Until you discover that, and that is until the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, you know what? You're not going to grow. You're not going to mature. You're not going to have the insight, the understanding, the perspective that you need to have in order to walk mightily with God, doing the things that he would have you to do. So Paul, and we'll see this a few times throughout this epistle, he speaks emphatically about the will of God. So here's the key. 
If your faith is precious to you, if it's the foundation of your life, if it's what causes you to make the decisions that you make do the things that you do, if your faith is important to you, then you're going to be passionate and committed to the will of God. So he writes here, Paul, an apostle of Messiah Yeshua, by the will of God, and he mentions someone else, Timothy. Timothy, and your Bible might say uh, our brother, but literally, it simply says the brother. And I believe here that Paul is doing something. When you study the New Covenant, you'll find that there was a close relationship between Paul and this young man called Timothy. Timothy was extremely helpful, valuable, we might say, to Paul, and Paul performing what God had called him to do, his will for his life. And therefore, Paul says not just our brother, but he says the brother, meaning this. Timothy is a good example of what a brother in the Lord is to be. So Timothy and Paul is writing this, and notice it says, look now to verse 2, to the Colossians, the saints, and that means the holy ones, those who are submitting to the purposes of God, realize that saint, or that word holy one, it's always in regard to the purpose of God and the faithful brethren in Messiah. And that's something that we should stop and pause on because we're going to see in this epistle to the Colossians and so much in the other writings of Paul that he emphasizes this expression when he says, in Messiah. If you're going to be fruitful, if you're going to be pleasing to God, if you're going to go through this transformation, this biblical change, then you need to be in Messiah. And that is, in His will, in access to the anointing of the Holy Spirit, His leadership in your life. In other words, everything that's good, everything that's pleasing to God, it's always dependent upon you being in Messiah. When you're in Messiah, the benefits are numerous and they are eternal. He then goes on, as he so frequently does in these epistles, he writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Messiah Yeshua. And as we talked about in our last series from the epistle to the Philippians, we mentioned that there's that order, grace, and then the phrase peace. Grace establishes peace with God, that is, that healed relationship. But there's something more than that. When we talk about peace, you know what should come into our mind? The will of God. And therefore, one of the purposes of God's grace is to bring about change whereby we begin, through the grace of God, we begin to fulfill the will of God accomplishing His purposes, so grace is so valuable. And we're going to see as we go through the next several weeks, over and over, Paul does two things. He comes back to this concept of grace, and you know what else he speaks about? Thanksgiving. And I think that there's a relationship between them. That is to say that when you receive God's grace naturally, you are going to be a thankful person because God's grace has so many benefits attached to it. Not only does God's grace save us, but it gives us a different mindset whereby the promises of God can be taken hold of by the faithfulness. So we receive grace by faith, but then grace produces faithfulness. Let me say it in a different way. Grace produces obedience in one's life. And we're going to see without any doubt that Paul is going to emphasize here behavior. And that is something that I'm going to keep coming back to throughout our study, that our behavior as believers is extremely important to God. Understand something. Prior to salvation, prior to this process known as justification, where God, He forgives all of our sins and He justifies us, what does that mean? He makes us acceptable to Himself. Through whom? Through Messiah Yeshua. 
what he did upon that tree, laying down his life, shedding his blood, earning for us, purchasing for us. Purchasing, it is a, an accusation, and that is very important because what does it do? Redemption tells that we belong, we have been purchased, that God has acquired us. So he makes this purchase so that we can be an individual that belongs to God and thereby, thereby obeys him. Behavior, and we'll see this, is extremely important to God. Look now to, to verse 3. He says, we, not just speaking for himself, but we're going to find probably more often than not when we complete this epistle. In chapter 4, he mentions here in chapter 1, Timothy, but there's other people with Paul. And therefore, even though that this epistle primarily is from Paul himself and Timothy, realize something. He's also speaking for others who he is ministering to and with for this, this establishment of different congregations throughout this area. Here we're talking about a congregation that's in uh, western Turkey. And in a few minutes, he's also going to speak about Laodicea, that city. And the scholars will tell us that, that this town, Colossae, with Laodicea, they weren't very far apart. And therefore, what he's saying to them at Colossae is also something that is relevant for those believers in Laodicea. Verse 3, he says, We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Messiah Yeshua. So Paul, he says, we give thanks. Why? He's excited because he's seen the work of God in these individuals. Paul, he was there. He shared that message of the gospel. He discipled them. He had others working with this congregation. And he sees the outcome. Let me say that differently. He sees the faithfulness of God to mature, to grow these individuals, whereby they are multiplying and they are having an impact in their community. And not just in their community, but in other cities as well. So he says, we give thanks to God, and he mentions so frequently, God our Father, or the Father of Messiah Yeshua. What does that mean? Well, in the scripture, when we refer to God as Father, one of the thoughts that should come into our mind, one of the concepts, is God as a provider. And Paul is constantly, when he speaks about God the Father, he is making a statement that all these good things that are being accomplished, they are all because of the provision of God. He gets the glory, all thanks to Him. That's what he says. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Messiah Yeshua, always concerning you, praying. Now, probably in most English translations that you're following along with, it says that we pray for you. But what's emphasized here in the original language, what's emphatic is, for you, we're praying. So the emphasis is not just on prayer, but the emphasis is upon this congregation. Paul wants to know that he's not only praying, but emphasizing that he and others are praying for them. And what are they praying? Look now to verse 4. He says, after hearing your faith, and here's the second time, in Messiah Yeshua. Faith specifically in Messiah Yeshua. Now learn something. Faith is a word of commitment. You need to write that down and learn that. Faith is a word of commitment. When you have faith in God, what you're saying is, I want to be committed to the things that are pleasing to God. I want to live a life that shows a commitment to scriptural truth and that my life is going to be committed to the revelation of God, whatever it might be. That is my mindset. That is who I have become. So Paul says, since we have heard of your faith in Messiah Yeshua and the love, the love that this congregation had for who? It says, for all the saints. So they are, and the word love is a giving word. The word love 
is a sacrificial word. What Paul is revealing to us is this. Not only do these people have they accepted the gospel, having received redemption, having believed in the sufficiency of Messiah's work on that tree. No, we find that that all has produced a change whereby they are living now sacrificially. They are living now in a giving way. That's what love is. Love is sacrificing. Love is giving. Love is using your life in order to be a blessing to others. And early on in this epistle, we see that Paul is emphasizing he sees that type of behavior in this congregation. Let me ask you, when, when God is watching you, and by the way, He is watching you constantly, when God looks at you, does He see an individual that is demonstrating love, demonstrating a lifestyle that is sacrificial in order to be a blessing? to someone else, willing to give of yourself to them. This congregation, this is one of the foremost things that Paul emphasizes to you and me, how he's thanking God, how they have heard the testimony of the love that they have. Notice what it says here, for all the things. And what brings us about? What uh, motivates them? What is the catalyst that causes them to live in this loving, giving, sacrificial way? Well, we'll see it right here where he says, on account of the hope, and realize that word hope is always connected to the written promises of God. And that's why if you don't know the Bible, if you don't know the promises of God, you're not going to live properly. You're not going to be motivated. You're not going to be doing the things that demonstrates the love of God that you have received. In other words, instead of living a life that's pleasing to God, you're going to live a life, even though you're a believer, much like those who are not believers. And Paul's going to talk extensively on that in a few moments. So he says that he was impressed that he has heard testimony from others about the love that they have. And look again, verse 5. All of this, the catalyst, was the hope that had been laid up for you in heaven. Now, write down something. More often than not, when the word heaven is used here, you know what should come into our mind? Kingdom. There is, biblically speaking, an inherent relationship between heaven and the kingdom when we die that moment what does the scripture say to be absent from the body is to be present with the lord so the moment a believer dies his soul will be intimate will be transferred to the kingdom of heaven and what uh, paul is reminding them is that we have a kingdom hope and with the kingdom are the promises of God. So it's these promises, these covenantal promises that we read about, not only in the New Covenant, but also throughout the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, what's called commonly the Old Testament. And this was changing them drastically. So the hope that has been laid up for you in heaven, which you have heard previously, where? In the Word. And notice where it says, in the word of truth of the gospel. Now, this is the first time that Paul has referred to the gospel in this epistle by name. And notice the word that he uses that surrounds the gospel. What is it? It is the word truth. And let me share with you that consistently, we'll see this in many places, in this epistle to the Colossians, we're going to see that Paul emphasizes this concept of truth when he speaks about the word, the word of truth. And here he says that word, first and foremost, foundationally, is the gospel. And how should we understand the gospel? Good news about redemption. If there's redemption, there has to be a redeemer, and that is Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, who redeems us 
and we'll come across this quickly. He redeems us from all of our transgressions, all of our iniquity, all of our sins. And I like that, all, all of them. His work of redemption is sufficient, it is complete, it was perfect, and it brings about the desires of God in your life if you submit, if you receive what He has done. And that's why He emphasizes here the word of truth of the gospel. Look at verse 6. He says here, which has come to you just as it has to all in the world. Now, does that mean at this time all the world, the gospel has come to them? No. What he's saying is this. He's telling us that this message of the gospel, it is for all the world. It is not unique to one particular ethnic group, one group of people, one nation, one location. No. He says this gospel, this truth, is truth for everyone. You know what I just despise? I, I despise when people talk about my truth. And that implies I have a truth and maybe you have a truth and she has a truth and this nation has a different truth than that other nation and so forth. That is all wrong. It is a deceitful, false teaching. No, truth belongs to God. And God reveals His truth to humanity. Now, He began that revealing it to His chosen people. Chosen, not favorite, chosen for a purpose. And that purpose, repeatedly we see that in the Scripture, is that, that they, the Jewish people, might be the light, a source of revelation an instrument of illumination for who? Like to the nations, that is, to all the world. So it's not a specific truth to a group. It is a world truth. It is a truth for humanity. So he says, look again at verse 6, that has come to you just as in all the world and is, and this is great because this is exactly what the truth of the gospel does, it produces what? It produces fruit. Just as in you from the day that you heard of it and you've come to know, and that is an experiential knowledge, that you've come to know the grace of God, what does it say? In truth. Now notice, just a few verses and we've seen the word truth appear twice. And notice the connection. When words are repeated, it has a purpose, not just to emphasize, but sometimes to tie things together. He speaks, going back up to, to verse 5 at the end, he speaks about the word of truth, the gospel. And then at the end of verse 6, he talks about that you have come to know or experience the grace of God in truth. Now here's the point. You cannot accept the grace of God if you don't accept the truth of God. And what's the truth of God? Well, it tells us in the previous verse. It's the gospel. So this word truth appears twice because it ties the gospel and grace together. It is truth, the gospel, and it is only able to bestow upon you God's grace, which is a transforming grace, a grace that brings so much change into a person's life, it's only possible when you receive it as the truth of God. And then he goes on, look at verse 7. He says, just as you were taught from Ephratus, the beloved, our beloved fellow servant. And that word servant can mean slave. Later on in our study, we're going to be talking about this concept of slave. And when the Bible uses the term slave, as it does frequently in certain passages in the Old Testament, it has nothing, nothing, nothing what to do with that horrible slavery that was in the United States many, many years ago. And actually continues slavery, you may not know this, but slavery is actually on the rise throughout the world. People, men and women, children being enslaved. We talk often, we hear on the news of trafficking, and we see trafficking people, that is, having, dealing with people as 
commerce as merchandise. It's, incre- it's not getting better. It's getting worse. But this term of slavery in the Bible has nothing to do with what normally comes into a mind of a person when they hear slavery. Biblical slavery, we'll talk about it in the weeks to come, is very, very different. So he speaks about this man, Epaphras, the beloved, our beloved fellow servant, who is faithful, a faithful minister of Messiah, notice what he says, in your behalf. Now, here's another example of someone giving, giving of themselves. This man, and we'll meet him again in chapter 4, he is someone who is giving his life in behalf of this congregation. Why is that? Because he has received the love of God, and the love of God, it's contagious. The love of God, it will cause you to become an instrument of that same love, that you share it with others. So this man is a faithful servant of Messiah in your behalf. And it says also this one has told us of your love. How? Notice what he says. Your love in the Spirit. Now, two or three times we have a reference of in Messiah, in Christ. And now we have, as we end up this first passage, at the end of verse 8, it says, He has told us of your love. That love didn't originate with them, as I said. It's the love that they have received from God by means of that gospel of truth. When they received it into their life. And what's the outcome? Well, now that they are in the Spirit. And that's so important. Because as I say so frequently, it is the Spirit of God that brings divine, godly, heavenly kingdom order into a person's life. Without the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Him indwelling in you, without that baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are not going to be able to do anything pleasing to God. So as we conclude this first session, we see that Paul wants to emphasize that this congregation in Colossae, it is a congregation who are in the Spirit, and the Spirit leads them to demonstrate love, to walk in truth, to be empowered by God's grace, and to be a catalyst for change in their community. And that's what every believer is called to be, a catalyst for change. We change so that we can change others. Paul is excited about this congregation. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.